Sean Frain is a co-founder and CEO of Looking Glass, which is a startup based in Brooklyn and Hong Kong. And uh, we're going to hear today about, uh, um, about his work. Prior to Looking Glass, well, he has lots of different you know, uh, accolades. Um, he's got a degree from MIT, which I have to say is a good place to be from. And uh, today's talk is entitled, A Low-Cost Static Volumetric Display Based on Layered High Incidence Angle Scattering. So I'll give you Sean Frain. Thanks. Ready? Thanks for having me here. Um, really awesome to be here in this audience. I've followed a lot of your all's work through the years, so it's neat to see human beings attached to the papers that I've been reading for the last uh, 10 years. <laughs> um, so I'll be presenting on a different type of volumetric display that has some resonance with um, systems that you all have probably read about in the literature and some of you have developed. Um, the approach that Looking Glass takes, uh, we're a startup and we take a slightly different approach than a number of labs have taken in chasing this dream um, of three-dimensional content that a group of people can interact with without headgear. Uh, our approach is to create systems that are sub $1,000 primarily. And we use that as a primary design constraint input. <clears throat> and that actually limits uh, the tools that we have at our disposal. Um, the space that we're in um, is the space that a lot of the speakers today are in as well, um, in which there's a third zone that a lot of the press isn't talking about. Um, of volumetric and light field and various autostereoscopic displays that don't require headgear. Um, just so you know where I'm coming from, my personal belief is that 20 years down the road, um, headgear-based systems uh, will be used 10 to 20% of people's time, um, but the rest of the time there will be these no headgear systems. So that will, uh, that's important to understand because that has shaped the research that we do in Looking Glass. Um, the applications of volumetric display, just to calibrate it for those of you who aren't familiar, <clears throat> it's a, it's a uh, type of display where a group of people can see and interact with three-dimensional content without having to have headgear on. And it's um, almost unique, um, not quite unique, but almost unique in that it's a display in which that group of folks um, can see the content almost as if they were seeing a real object that is dynamic and updating at 30 to 60 frames per second. Um, one other uh, background note for Looking Glass is that we uh, are generally technology agnostic in, in the sense that we're not founded by a lab that developed a particular type of technology um, and then we developed the startup around that. We have this end goal of low cost um, display that folks can interact with without headgear. So we ran a bunch of background experiments um, on the traditional type of volumetric display in which there's a moving platen and high-speed light engine that didn't meet our criteria for a low-cost volumetric display that we could produce for in the hundreds of dollars bill of materials um, because it required a high-speed light engine uh, if we were going to do um, full color systems, which was another design constraint um, that made it too cost prohibitive, um, and the moving platen limited the size system that we could achieve. Um, we've also uh, created, over the past few years, um, uh, rotating LED arrays, which I know a lot of you all are familiar with, in which you flash LEDs at a fantastically uh, fast rate, and you can create um, full walk-around autostereoscopic um, or volumetric display. Um, in this case, this is a guy that I scanned. Um, this is 50,000 voxels. This didn't meet the criteria um, for uh, being able to have a human being in the display that could be recognizable, so we dropped that. And then there is another system which is most similar to our system um, in which there's a known moving parts approach that was developed at Columbia in the cave lab there um, in which you have scattering elements that are made by subsurface induced laser subsurface induced um, cracks in a crystal and then in a serial scattering process, you project a low speed projector and essentially projection map um, the, let's say, 2 million pixels from a 1080p DMD light engine into that block. Uh, and 
each step along the way, you suck out, let's say, 10% or 5% of the pixels, scatter them, the 95% remaining, go on to the next layer, pull out 5%, and so on. Um, there's an obvious geometry limitation to that in which you need to space the scattering elements to allow the light to reach subsequent scattering elements. Um, you can account for this somewhat with diffusing elements, uh, but there is a limit. Um, and so what we ended up settling on <coughs> is a parallel approach um, using a traditional low speed, full color DMD projector engine um, that uses 10 light guides, that's what this system uses here, um, to essentially take the 2 million pixels in a 1080p DMD light engine, um, map 10 slices of content into that video frame, and then uh, re-extract out the three-dimensional scene it, using those 10 light guides, um, all with the process being done in parallel for the slices. Uh, this is um, uh, just a few applications. I'll obviously show you in the real device. Um, Incidentally, these devices are um, prototype systems, but Looking Glass does make all of our prototypes available um, for folks essentially at cost or below our cost, so researchers outside of our lab can exper experiment with what we're doing. Um, we have a lot of software tools uh, that are letting developers, primarily in the Brooklyn area, but also um, in Tokyo and in Hong Kong, um, and a few in San Francisco experiment with getting CT scan content um, and different interactive content into the displays. Um, this is the way that the system works. Um, it'll become quite obvious to you uh, what we're doing once I turn on the system. Um, I should say one thing, another prop to pass around. Um, so before we had uh, figured out this parallel process of, uh, that uses conventional light engines um, and essentially a projection mapping technique in 10 light guides to do volumetric display. Uh, we wanted to see what the potential was down the road. So I'll show you one step along the way. Eventually, we believe that uh, volumetric display will achieve this style of resolution, perhaps not this occlusion control, um, but certainly this uh, widened view angle and this resolution. Um, we made these uh, volumetric prints, which are done using a traditional 2D uh, UV inkjet printer um, as an illustration tool. Uh, this is about 50 slices of acrylic with uh, um, an optical oil, a silicon oil in this case, that matches the refractive index of the slices of plastic in the box. That is exactly what we're doing in the uh, light folding volumetric display, but in which the ink is essentially replaced with dynamic light that updates at 30 to 50 frames a second. So you can pass that around. Um, of course, we've, uh, there's a number of variations in the lab that aren't here today in which we use anamorphic elements to uh, squash down the image and also um, ways to remap the content that is more uh, pixel efficient per slice. If we, uh, you'll see in the mapping that I'm going to show you in about one minute, um, when we take a 1080p projector uh, image space and chop that up in the simplest way of um, essentially taking the uh, 1200 pixel axis and splitting that up 10 times. That essentially means that we've downgraded the pixel quality per slice on, the, um, on each of the slices of the volumetric display to a very odd um, resolution of 120 pixels um, by 1920 pixels. Um, this is perhaps below the threshold necessary for a retail-ready um, system that a general consumer can use. Uh, but our view was it did meet the criteria of showing a human being with volumetric video taken with a number of depth sensors out there, such as um, Google Tango tablet, um, some, some uh, volumetric video applications we developed for occipital structure sensor and so on. So uh, we released it uh, as a developer kit. Um, uh, let me just show you the system running.
So it's uh, very transparent. Each of the slices is um, in the high 90s uh, percent transparency. So overall, the overall transparency meets or exceeds the transparency of most single plane transparent OLEDs. Um, we've developed uh, 20 or 30 applications um, in this uh, system, and there are more that other folks in our community are developing um, as well. I can also pass around a small system that we recently developed that's about this big, um, which again, we're going to make available uh, essentially at our cost. Um, the bill of materials on the smaller system uh, is sub $200. Um, so to give you a sense, th this could potentially open up volumetric display in a way that um, hasn't been feasible before. Um, and the question is whether we're meeting the resolution demands or not. Um, I know there'll be a lot of technical questions once I show this, so um, I'm essentially going to show this demo and have two more slides and then um, five minutes or so for questions. So this demo right here is actually straight from uh, Leap Motion's um, playground set. Um, most of you over there, unfortunately, won't be able to see it. Um, the view cone that you can see this content in a coherent manner is dependent on the content. Um, we're developing improvements to our SDK that can uh, improve that issue. Um, but for those of you who can see this, you should see my hands inside the system. And um, there, are, there are 10 planes of volumetric content inside this display. Of course, I can interact with that content and move it around in the volume. Um, this would be a neat experiment to do with the professor that was talking about the faux haptic feedback um, that you get when you see a simulated hand. In my view, the, single, the singular question of no glasses display is whether a simulated hand interacting with content is more compelling than a um, hand interacting directly with content. Um, and that's what we're uh, working on vigorously in Looking Glass. Um, one other thing to note, one other technical detail, is this is filled with a resin that is close, but not quite the refractive index of the light guides that we use. Um, the mismatch between the refractive index of the light guides and the resin is our lever that allows us to tune the intensity of the scattering um, and the transparency. That's the trade-off, um, obviously. Uh, and that also gives us the byproduct of compressing the, the um, apparent depth by around 40-ish percent. Just like if you look in a pond of water, it looks like the apparent depth is compressed. Uh, similarly, we get that benefit. In this system, I say it's a benefit because the closer the slices are spaced in a given volume, the wider the view cone. Um, in fact, we found that we can push down the number of slices in this uh, type of display to five um, slices and um, depth fuse them. I'm going to shut that off for a second. Uh, depth fuse them um, uh, using a, a few techniques we developed. Obviously, there are other researchers that are doing depth fusing with between two to four uh, slices of content um, that's kind of just blending together based on the depth map. Um, and uh, we found that within a relatively tight view cone, as few as five volumetric slices um, in a volume such as this is uh, uh, sufficient to give very strong three-dimensional um, feedback uh, for interactive um, applications. A um, few more slides. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, about half of our team is hardware, half is software. Um, and uh, we view one of the issues uh, that folks have faced in the past um, when making a new platform, um, besides just the availability of prototypes out in the market, which we're trying to address, um, has been the availability of very robust tools to let people port existing content or create new content in the systems. So um, we, spent, we spent and continue to spend considerable effort um, primarily on two ways to get content into this system um, and other volumetric display systems if anyone is interested because this software is released under the MIT license, which, as some of you know, is 
basically the most open of all open source licenses. Um, and uh, essentially, anything that appears inside of a cube that's drawn in Unity, which is the primary pipeline that we use, um, is sliced up. All of the depth fusing is done in the background, and then that appears in the display, um, either as a second window or as an exported build or application. Um, we also have released a free uh, volumetric video app that runs uh, using the structure sensor right here. Um, this is anticipating the day in a year or two when most people's phones have some sort of depth camera on them. This is already the case with the iPhone 7 Plus um, and with the Lenovo Fab 2. Uh, we don't have access to the Apple SDK for the um, iPhone 7 Plus quite yet, but we expect that they will be releasing that um, sometime, hopefully soon. Uh, in which case, we could then um, adapt this application to use a traditional phone without this sort of attachment right now, which only super nerds like me would ever carry around. Um, this is, incidentally, the structure sensor by Occipital, a wonderful group uh, that we're friends with in San Francisco. Um, and uh, all of this content, if anyone is in the VR or AR fields, um, all of this recorded content is platform agnostic, in which it, by which I mean you can pull it into um, any of your platforms to compare uh, what the experience is in volumetric display with VR and AR. We're trying to be very, uh, um, uh, let's see, uh, experimental in the sense of not um, forcing folks to use one platform, but seeing how people truly react to content in the different platforms. Um, that's the main content of my talk. Thank you for having me and would like to answer some questions.